Welcome everyone. Um, I'm Julia Zerniak. I'm the professor of architecture and associate dean at Syracuse Architecture. And I've been pleased to put together this lecture series this semester on design and the biodiverse. And we are in the fourth of six lectures and they've been kind of quite amazing and stimulating to date and today's will be no different. So I'm thrilled to welcome Aaron Moore who is a professor in the Department of Architecture and Environmental Studies program at the University of Oregon. Uh, Moore works in teaching research and design practice on the environmental context of building construction and on the ways that buildings shape and reflect cultural constructions of nature. She uses her architecture practice float um, uh, to as a testing ground for designing with explicit intentions for the ecological context of buildings. I've had the opportunity to review closely Erin's work and I'm um, and her writing. She's a, a wonderful writer and we can't wait to hear what you have to tell us. So welcome. Thanks very much. It's really nice to be here. Here I will share my screen. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much to Julia for this intention really to biodiversity and design. It's really quite welcome. And to all of you for being here. And as Julia said, I'm a professor of architecture and environmental studies at the University of Oregon. That means I teach design studio and collaborate closely uh, with colleagues who work on topics on the environment. But to be honest, I'm really curious who you all are. Uh, students in Syracuse, etc. And I'm wondering if you would be willing to put a quick hello in the chat, just to say, hi, this is who I am. This is where I am geographically or spatially um, or academically where you are in the program. And I think, are you just back from spring break? Is that right? And, okay. Yes, we're back from spring break and I expect my students there we, the, to write something where you, what, where you are in the curriculum, if you're a graduate or undergraduate. So, that would so be, okay, so it's a mix. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. So if you'd yeah. be willing to say hello. Ah, good. Thanks, uh, Yvonne, um, for the geographical and academic location, and I'm hoping others will join in. So today I'm going to illustrate my remarks in the context of um, my architectural work. So and this is carried out under the framework of my design research and critical spatial practice float and also with some student work. And then so I'm gonna, I'll caption the images as best I can, but if you want more context, things like project statements, uh, additional acknowledgements and, and references, I would point you to the float work website. Um, and how fun to see folks introducing themselves on chat, keep it up. Uh, so I'm gonna take about 45 minutes to make a case for the inseparability of some things, of matter, of atmosphere, water, time, and inseparability of forms of life, and then to draw some conclusions on the implications of this inseparability for my own design practice. And so this is meant to build on the talks that you've already had on biodiversity and design, hopefully by taking the paradigm shifts a little farther, and then offering some direction for design practice in the context of these ways of thinking. We have some geographic diversity in the room. That's great. So even so, we're in a global space. It looks like a virtual space. We can still do a little bit of a we are here. So I'm here at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon, and here in Eugene, we're located within the traditional homelands of the Southern Kalapuya, where descendants of the Kalapuya are currently citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians including my colleagues here at the University of Oregon. Starting with the inseparability of matter, let's do a little bit more we are here. Let's check in on where each of you are, where we are as a whole. So and ask each of you to consider the space you're currently inhabiting and ask you some architecture questions. So right now, where is your body relative to the mass and the void of your space? Or more specifically, what is the shape of the material that supports your body? The, the floor, is it a floor? Are your, are your feet on the floor? Are you sitting on a chair? And then think about the solidity of the floor and consider 
that the floor material, like all matter, is made up of atoms. This is under your feet, inviting you to, to um, feel the weight of your feet on the floor. And that the atoms under your feet are mostly space between the tiniest vibrating bits of actual mass. So if you were to draw that space, if you're going to draw a cross section of the floor, you would draw it as a solid, but in fact, it's mostly empty space between the atoms, but we're drawing it as an opaque volume, as mass, the way you might draw, I think, a spinning propeller with a completed circle. I also would invite you to put your hand on the surface, a surface, any surface, your desk or something, and feel its temperature and consider that you can't really draw a clean line between that surface and the air. There's, it's impossible to describe just where one material begins and the other ends or between the material of your desk and, and, and your hand. And so I'm hoping to suggest that we exist in a continuum of constantly moving matter that's mostly space and that is all of one thing. And I'm gonna go even farther to propose the distinction that you're taught in introductory studio between mass and void. And I've just taught this, so I know that you've learned it too, where you cut a cross section and you poche the mass, that the distinction between mass and void was actually, is, is false, that from, really from a dynamic molecular perspective, the idea of solidity or stasis or even edge of the mass or the material is not very well accurate because of uh, even the void in the mass and void is material. So just to make this case, I'm going to invite you to hold your two hands to make a cup. And if your hands are the same size as mine, the air that you're holding has about the same weight so you're holding air in your hands as 36 grains of rice. And this is to show that the atmosphere, the type of space that's usually classified as void in the mass void diagrams of architectural drawing has substance. That we're existing in a continuum of mass that includes the architectural solids and then also the architectural void, which is the atmosphere. And you know, if we're really looking for a void, we have to look past the atmosphere. We have to look past the seven miles of um, seven mile thick layer of gases that we're existing in when the atmosphere thins to almost nothing. So this is to say that here on the surface of the planet, we exist in a continuum of inseparable matter that includes a very thin uh, blanket of gases. Talking about the atmosphere, as I know you know, just as different building materials absorb more heat energy for longer, right? So concrete absorbs and holds more heat for longer than say aluminum. Some gases in the atmosphere hold more of the sun's heat and for longer. So this is gases like carbon dioxide and methane that hold far more heat and for a longer time than say oxygen or nitrogen. That atmosphere as a material has thermal mass. And so the way that we might think of material and time in the heating and cooling of constructed space, as we're taught to do in buildings, it's become clear that it's necessary to include the matter and energy of the atmosphere as well, especially, I'll say, in consideration of the uptake of carbon dioxide by plants, trees, soils, the ocean. So this is more complete architectural design site for the construction of environments from the scale of the body, to the room, to the building, to the landscape, to the city, to the ecoregion, so that the atmosphere is material. Um, this is the space outside um, that is not a void. Um, and we're talking about a material environment that's shaped by the respiration of soils, of forests, the ocean, by combustion of burning. And I know you know I'm talking about climate change, that in the face of catastrophic climate change and its impacts, global temperatures, weather events, extinctions, that really there's no more important architectural relationship to attend to. These are the relationships between plants, materials, and the atmosphere, and the relationship between energy in the atmosphere, between plants, oceans, and soils. So I'm hoping that I offered a little bit 
of a case for the inseparability of matter, of material as a continuum in which we exist, and the inse inseparability of atmosphere as one of those, as a category of material, as architectural site, as, a, as critical architecture, relationships and architecture. So the next whole, inseparable whole that I want to propose is that of time. So we're talking about climate change. And in this context, I'm going to make a case for the inseparability of the past and future. So climate change is a topic that we might associate with the future, with the future of the climate. We think about what will happen. And we've had a number of years, for example, we have a number of years to phase out fossil fuels or else. And Yes, um, I'll say my opposition to the construction of infrastructure for the extraction and movement of fossil fuels comes from my own acute alarm about climate, climate disruption and its consequences. And I'll also say that in the last few years, it has seemed to me as I experienced them, that all the, some of them, that all of the terrible impacts that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, uh, forecast and graphed, uh, very tidily in their assessment reports that they seem to be coming to pass one after another and all at the same time. Um, fire, uh, food insecurity, global, increased global conflict. And honestly, looking forward seems like looking forward to a kind of precipice. And listing these, these um, consequences, I feel, is almost too much sometimes because to acknowledge the loss and the injustices because of climate change, I'll say frankly, exceeds my own capacity for grief. And that the kind of grief and loss that climate change, I will say, and pandemic disease actually, represent came first some time ago to this continent. And this is where I think it's important to check in on time frames here that the kind of loss that we're talking about from climate change is much more new to the colonizer, which I um, identify than it is to the colonized. And in fact, the kinds of grief and loss that climate change and pandemic disease bring forth first came to North America with the violent extractive processes, practices of colonization, settlement, and slavery. And I'll quote the art historian T.J. Demos, who writes that the climate emergency has, according to this reading, not emerged as the inadvertent consequence of industrial modernity affecting all equally. Rather, it's resulted from centuries of colonial pillage, violent environmental transformation, and genocidal destruction, creating and perpetuating profound systemic injustice. And as another consequence of the same practices, climate change is as much a problem of the past as it is a problem of the future. And the temporal side of resistance, I would argue, given this, is simultaneously the past and the future. So in order to address climate change in architecture, it's necessary both to look forward and then also to look back at some of the, the, the same uh, structures that are responsible um, for past injustices that are also at the root of, of current and future climate change. So still talking about the inseparable whole of time of past and present here. I want to tell you about watching in 2017, the artist Alison Akuchuk Warden, who wrapped her performance, er, performed her rap Ancestor from the Future at a Nevada Museum of Art opening of the exhibition Unsettled. And she did this by making us, she started by making a circle of her arms above her head with her hands almost, but not touching at the top of the circle. And she explained, and you could try this, putting, if you get some exercise, put your hands above your head, making a circle and having a gap between your hands. Uh, Warden explained that we're living in the gap between her hands, between the past and the future, as represented by the two halves of the symmetrical circle of her arms. And she wrapped as Akumatu, and performed as a female ancestor time traveling to the future, earnestly encouraging her great great greats to manifest their destiny. So in the song and in the body space diagram of time, she's organized temporal space symmetrically, looking one way around to the great great greats of the past and looking around the other way to the great great greats of the future. And so living this moment where we are as between Akumatu's two hands requires looping back simultaneously to apply truth telling reconciliation and repair to the future and to the past. And I, I believe this strongly about design that 
the simultaneous past and futures are the inseparable places to address the injustices of the power structures, extraction economies uh, that both underlie colonial settlement and climate change. And this is significant in, in the way that I think about design. But before we go there, let's talk, a let's do a little bit more sort of we are here. Um, and thank you um, folks who have said where they are in the chat. So let's check in a little bit more on where each of you are. So I invite each of you to consider the space that you're currently in, your actual viewpoint. Um, and here's some architecture questions for you. Well, how is the physical positioning of your body in the world? How is that shaped by the design structures that you're inhabiting? And how do the structures that you're, with, you're in, whether it's a car, or an, a, a room um, or in a landscape, how are these spaces shaping the way you see your world right now at this moment, whether you're watching this live or recorded? And still checking in on the spaces that you're in, how does the design of the space that you're in shape your relationship with others? Who is allowed in your spaces? Um, who's not allowed in, in your room? on your street, in your neighborhood, in your city, and in your country. And then also with what species do you share these spaces? So in our human-centered worlds, this one I think requires some imagination. How is the structure of your designed environment at the scale of the room, the building, the city, the landscape, how is the that organizing your physical relationship with, say, birds? Or how is the structure partitioning your relationship with, say, insects? And I would bet that the space you're in is designed very specifically to organize your relationship with insects. And I'm thinking of all of our screens, our windows, and our foundation detailing. And I have to ask you, too, how is the architecture organizing your relationship with your microbiome? the microbiology of your home or even of your body. And I'm giving a nod here to the work done at University of Oregon by my extraordinary colleagues on the microbiology of the built environment and the body, where their work is really making visible the species with which we share our space and our bodies, the, the microbiome that um, clouds around our feet and carpets, and also the microbiota that we share with one another and I think you know this now from a previous talk in this series that any human is not one species, but many, um, you know, the, the human individual plus the, the many species of our microbiome. And that the line between one or the, between organisms, the organisms that are me and those with whom I share this space is rather blurry. So we could say that there is an inseparable of our biological continuum. So speaking of interdependence or inseparability, I, I ask you briefly about water. So similarly, where is the line in your architectural space uh, between I'm going to back up just a hair. Where is the line in your architectural space between the water of your body and the water of your home watershed and your atmosphere? And, and really asking the question whether there's a clear distinction. Is there any separability between the health or the relative pollution of your body and that of your air and watershed? And I do wish for each of you that you are in a space of healthy water, um, body and watershed. Indivisible, indivisible, indivi indivisible, inseparable. So we have indivisible matter, atmosphere, time, biological continuum, and now water. And I would argue that this ontology, that this way of understanding is a very awkward fit for the conventional practice of architecture and even for the education of architects. 
So in a reality in which there's complete indivisibility of the atmosphere and the plant and material world, and in which our lives depend on how everything interacts with plants, with other beings, the interchanges of gases in the atmosphere, that truly it makes no sense. I'll say, I say this as a, um, you know, as a practicing architect, that it makes no sense to separate the design of buildings from landscape architecture or ecological or eco-regional design. Uh, and I would say in the same reality, where the most globally impactful spaces are the ones most distant from the cultural center. So I'm thinking of data farms, mining, whether that's Bitcoin mining or mineral mining, forests, these could not be more important. Um, spaces of energy generation, wastewater, food production, spaces of industrial labor, that these, these are the spaces that warrant architectural attention. And I would also say that they're not necessarily the spaces that we attend to as much in architectural education or in commercial architectural practice. So really, um, my takeaway message is, is that I prefer to consider or really my takeaway trajectory is that I prefer to consider my work a spatial practice uh, beyond architecture and also to look outside the center for spaces uh, for intervention, so-called draw space, spaces of visible ecological complexity, spaces sometimes outside the city, uh, outside of um, spaces of outside economic centers. And then, so I mentioned that I, consider my practice critical spatial practice, uh, you know, a phrase that I use more maybe than architecture or than the term architecture. So as Brent Sterlickson wrote, writes in the introduction to the critical spatial practice forum on the, in the journal Society and Space, critical spatial practice is the production of space that's critical of oppressive regimes. While this use of the framework underlines the spatial nature of social struggles, the framework can also be understood more broadly as described by Jane Rendell in Art and Architecture, Place Between. The term indicates interest in exploring the specifically spatial aspects of interdisciplinary processes or practices that operate between art and architecture. Um, it was the, narr the narrowest definition. Um, frameworks and feminist spatial practice, such as those offered by the editors of Feminist Futures of Spatial Practice, I think move closer to use and understanding the roles of power and identity in spatial practices. So in that volume, Schalk, Christensen, and Mays write that the topic can be understood within a critical feminist tradition, examining how power in the form of political hegemonies and social injustice has been resisted and reconstructed through spatial practice. So pivoting a little bit to my own teaching and practice more explicitly, uh, the tools that I have are really just the toolkit or those in the toolkit of design, architecture, making, building. So really this is what I can share. These are the tools that I can work with and I'll offer a few thoughts on, on using design to put resistive forces on current trajectories. So I'll, I'll share a few principles that I use at the end but um, first check in a little bit more. So as I've invited you to reflect on your so-called individual body in this designed environment, I offer a, a few observations. So in this, the space that I'm in and the space that you are in um, are designed and built environments that we've constructed in ways that reflect and reinforce, I think to an extreme, the value systems of this moment. So each of these dwellings and work, workplaces, cars, tents that you're inhabiting are manifestations, physical artifacts of very particular environmental and social ethics. So the rooms and buildings and landscapes that you're in are real manifestations of the power structures or the social structures or the economic structures within which we exist. And unfortunately, the built environment I'm guessing most of us are inhabiting reflects and reinforces systems that place much power in the hands of a few. So I'm thinking of the defensible fortresses, or say neighborhoods of wealth and power that we've built. It's a built environment that really doesn't account for the multi-species interdependence that it's our ecosystem, food system, or whole well-being. 
And think, you know, just as one example of a many scaled myopia of the designing out of pollinating insects, that this is a built in. And this is also, and this is where I, um, positioning my work at this moment, that this is a built environment, buildings and infrastructure that's designed around cheap energy. So now moving your mind's eye out of the spaces that you're all in and inviting you into a different kind of space. This, in this case, the space of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and specifically the space of the fossil fuel transportation in the Pacific Northwest of North America. So I'm gonna use some student drawings from a recent studio to illustrate the spatial typology, the spatial, spatial typology of energy transportation. So in North America, the Pacific Northwest region sits directly between these enormous geological reserves of fossil fuels in the interior, that is coal mounts, oil shale, tar sands, and natural gas fields between those reserves and then the Pacific ports, so west of me, for export of these fuels to Asia. So the expanding energy markets in Asia and then the availability of these fuels in Central North America puts pressure on existing fuel transportation infrastructure across the Pacific Northwest. This is the, the space of, of energy transportation. So as an example, um, on the West Coast, there's five re refineries that are now receiving or plan to receive crude oil by rail car from the, the rock and shale formations in North Dakota. And railroads are moving 40 times more oil now than in 2008. Since 2012, the Pacific Northwest has faced proposals for four new coal export terminals on the Pacific coast, two new oil pipelines, I think it's more than that now, 11 oil by rail facilities and six new natural gas pipelines with liquefaction for export. And this is on top of the distribution system for local industrial use of fossil fuels in the Pacific Northwest. This is all talking about for export. So obviously the lines and pipelines are critical to the future and representative of the past harm of the global climate. And they're of a unique morphological category. So these are spaces that are defined by enormous length, slenderness, uh, relative invisibility and transcendence of ownership boundary. They're also, we can see it in the student work here, is much defined by the periodic disruption of the spaces by bridges, stations, ports, and sometimes protests. And when I say protests, I'm thinking of, for example, the vegetable garden that Extinction Rebellion members planted on the train tracks, blocking oil trains. I'm thinking of a flotilla of kayakers blocking a tanker, et cetera, not uncommon here in the Pacific Northwest. And the, the spatial aspects of protests or resistance are really interesting. So talking about pipelines in particular, so natural gas pipelines, oil pipelines are really hard to build across the Pacific Northwest. The Northwest is the nearly impenetrable thin green line, um, crediting here the Sightline Institute for the term, that forms the boundary between the sources of extraction and the pathway to market for fossil fuels. The Pacific Northwest region is mountainous and happens to have accumulated, not coincidentally, a lot of wealth. And people who don't need to put up with the oil industry in their view shed like in the major existing transportation corridors, uh, river valleys, the best ports. So this is Portland, Vancouver, Seattle. They're not going to put up with uh, as much new uh, fuel industry, the pipelines, et cetera. So if you want to find a path of least resistance for your new pipeline, hypothetically, you're limited to the isolated routes. And I'm really, I, I understand that this is really different from planning a pipeline construction in the Great Plains, for example where topography doesn't pose as much of a challenge. If one county or city doesn't want a pipeline, you can just shift a bit smoothly one way or another, ending up threading right through uh, often, um, threading right through tribal land, as we've seen with the Dakota Access Pipeline and others. So I just, I just showed you drawings of fossil fuel space. This is, this is architectural drawing, critical architectural re-representation to study a kind of space. It emphasizes or really magnifies the fossil, fossil fuel space. Given that, I want to acknowledge the power of drawing, of map making. 
When we represent something, when we choose to document or draw something, we give it power. Similarly, when we leave something out of a drawing, we leave something off of a map, we've removed its power, we've removed its agency. So you saw the space of fossil fuel transportation represented by the fuel pipelines ports, and in this one, the compressor stations of natural gas pipeline. But what does it leave out? Is there a way that we can use drawing to include and reclaim the aspects of this land, watersheds, and biotic communities that are made vulnerable by the rather toxic and actually explosive infrastructure of fossil fuel extraction? And these are the kinds of questions that I'm hoping those of you who are doing architecture studio right now are thinking about. How can you use drawing to include and reclaim the aspects uh, that are important um, or that you want to give power to? And how can you take away power by excluding things from your drawings? So what if in architecture, taking this further, instead of drawing cities, drawing humans and wealth, Instead of drawing property lines, roads, um, and out here in the West, roads usually first built for natural resource extraction, or drawing pipelines. What if we draw the ecological human and non-human, the more than human material whole? I really like this uh, student project as an example. So maybe you know about the principle of eminent domain, that there is a legal principle in which the government or its agent can expropriate, can take against someone's will private property for the purpose of benefiting the greater good, benefiting the public, as long as there's a fair uh, monetary price paid for, for that. So um, in this, my student here, Eric Wadman, was interested in the principle of an eminent domain and, and questioned what is really truly greater public good and proposed in this case, uh, a speculative drawing in which he's uh, expropriated the highway and the shopping mall in service of a um, wildlife corridor connecting two watersheds. So this is to argue that drawing has enormous power to show a different vision. Uh, here's my own experiment in doing that in reclaiming the media of architectural representation, in this case, the 3D printed topographical model. So I'm showing images of a project in which we were remapping the same space of fossil fuel transportation. This is mostly in Southern Oregon, mostly around the proposed route of the Pacific Connector Pipeline, but it includes other impacted land, Canadian Pacific watersheds, Dakotas. So this is a body of work, um, small topographic models of the space of fossil fuel transportation that was exhibited in the European Cultural Center exhibition Time Space Existence at the Palazzo Mora in Venice last year. So these, are, these models are topographies described spatially and also temporally that show tides, solar warmth, salmon runs, hydrological cycles. So the topography is generated by data in X, Y, and Z coordinates, usually relational data over seasons and years or relative to physical space. So it's a remapping of the space of fossil fuel transportation. And it's intended to demonstrate the value of land in terms of ecological holism, nutrient cycling, and habitat biodiversity rather than in terms of extraction and profit. It's an alternative way of drawing in three dimensions. So ideally, the new topography should demonstrate the human experience of time as cyclical in weather and water levels and as material decays and accumulates. And so in this way, the new topography should draw attention to the simultaneous ecological past and future of the lands. Think about time again. So there's meant to be two things going on here. One is the choices that we're making about what kinds of things to represent and that we're giving form to things we believe have the most real value. That this is value not in terms of commodities or ownership or extraction, but in terms of the ecological whole. So for example, I'm choosing to map value in terms of winter bird migration rather than extraction or to include the corporal form of the bird itself in our inventory of value, to choose and give form to reproduction over harvest relationship over resource. So this is to use drawing and design to give agency to the things of the most true value, the perpetual value. And this is a, a guiding principle for me to emphasize cycles, renewal, and the non-human whole. And then also to disempower through exclusion, the superficial and the short term. 
So I've been describing land or ecosystems that are defined by cycles and by ecological holism. And I've also been for a long time interested in renewing cycles in architecture and in buildings. And for example, the in the Issei Jingo Shrine in Japan, that's perpetually rebuilt every 20 years and now is in its 61st, 61st rebuilding cycle where the rebuilding uses wood from trees from a forest that's managed to renew alongside that same construction cycle. The kind of inseparability of material and time. So I've been interested in what it means to design buildings both for their construction and for their deconstruction, to have the ends of the lives of the buildings be as purposeful as their beginnings. And I've been interested in material cycling in buildings, the idea of building in ways that participates in the good kind of nutrient cycling rather than in some kind of using up. And I've also been interested in buildings as habitats for species other than or in addition to humans. So I love the court at Frida Kahlo's Blue House, the courtyard in Mexico City, that has clay jars set into the masonry parapet that houses swallows that feed on the insects that gather around the courtyard fountain. And uh, maybe similarly, but less romantically, I built a hibernaculum, so in other words, uh, underground snake habitat under this one. Uh, not sure it worked, uh, maybe it worked more for um, other animals, birds and insects, um, but we are happy to host plenty of frogs and once a lizard. So that's a long way of saying that this is behind all these kinds of sketches, the idea of a circular cross section of a pavilion uh, roofed in a spiral with some kind of thatch where only one side of the cross section is decent shelter for humans and where the other side is habitat for other things, capturing water and nutrients uh, rotting, a continuum of nutrient cycling ideally subverting the hierarchy of human inhabitation, multi-species habitat, something temporary. So I had the opportunity to design and prefabricate three pavilions based on this sketch, skipping over a lot of design and iteration we went through to get this right, uh, and to install them in protest uh, two years ago along the proposed routes of the Pacific Connector Pipeline, a natural gas pipeline that was proposed to move natural gas from Canada to ports for ex, uh, to a port for export to Asia. So here's prototypes. Uh, and for those of you who are interested, it's a triangulated truss with a complicated layering, essentially two hexagons that are offset. And um, shout out to the fabrication team led by Mike Krillos for these. So here's the basic diagram as in that, sh as in that sketch. Uh, one side shedding water and making human shelter. You can see a bench on that side and the other side collecting water, connecting, collecting nutrients, um, housing many creatures. So the Pacific Connector Pipeline is a 36 inch diameter, 229 mile natural gas pipeline that's proposed to carry fracked natural gas from existing pipelines in central Oregon across hundreds of water crossings to a liquefaction facility at Jordan Cove on the Coos Bay in Oregon. So this is a pipeline that's been proposed for years and the, in these, these uh, pavilions are placed uh, in the path of the proposed pipeline in protest. So I don't think I need to say um, but I will, that I don't, and I think that the new construction of infrastructure to support fossil fuel extraction is a terrible idea. That it's the definition of short term profit for very few individuals at immeasurable long term expense to the climate, to shared atmosphere, to regional habitat, to fisheries, and to our ability to move beyond dependence on subsidized fossil fuels. Uh, all the same. Also, the idea of the pipeline is an indefensible kind of wrong that's being duplicated up and down the West Coast and across the nation. So this is not about this particular pipeline, but it's about the decision making that's completely disconnected from good science and from any kind of good looking, uh, any kind of good, whether we look back or we look forward in the history and future of this land. So in protest of the construction of this pipeline, um, and in protest of the idea in general of the construction of fossil fuel uh, infrastructure, each of the pavilions is constructed on land um, that, that's stewarded by communities who are actively challenging the expropriation, 
the, the claiming of the land through eminent domain for pipeline construction. And so each of the sites is ecologically rich. One is estuarian, it's on an estuary. One is wetland and one is riparian, it's on a creek. So this is the salmon portal. This one's in the Umpqua watershed. Uh, and in the salmon portal over your right shoulder, you can see into the ripples of a salmon and lamprey spawning ground. And over your left shoulder, you can see the home of the family who um, uh, reconstructed the, the salmon spawning um, access on this land. So this, the salmon portal is in the riparian zone. It's on the edge of a, it's in a, a riparian zone on the edge of a creek. Um, and it was uh, thatched in Thule, which is a, an important local uh, wetland plant with an important cultural context. So here's some salmon space and some lamprey space. The pipeline would be in the um, pasture beyond here. Uh, and the, the portals are about the space of physical inhabitation, gathering here, understanding the place differently. But they're also about, you know, if, about physically being there, but they're also about the image of the places and a way of framing them. And, and in the case of this video, in terms of the natural cycles of the greater whole of the places that they're inhabiting. And this, this is the coquille portal. And at the coquille portal over your right shoulder, you can see the water coming up into a marshy pond. This is a stopover for migrating geese and a nesting place for marsh birds. Um, there were their uh, frog eggs in the spring, um, frog, uh, frogs the rest of the year. Um, and over your left shoulder, you can see the agricultural outbuildings of the family home if you're sitting on this bench here. Each of the three portals is structured in the same way. So, but this pavilion is thatched with tussock rush, rush, soft rush. It's with Juncus Ephesus that was cut on the Haynes Inlet. And this one is um, a good place for families, for birds, specific, specific, especially ducks and amphibians. This is the seeds of the Juncus. Um, if the pipeline were constructed, it would cross just to the west of the wetland, um, impacting gen multiple generations and the family in this place. The fam many families in this place. Sign that a duck was there. Okay, so jumping off to the coast, this is the Haynes Inlet portal. So here over your right shoulder, you can see an estuary that holds a thousand years of indigenous fish weirs. Um, in the muds of the estuary, you can see old growth forest where the seagoing marbled murelet nests. And over your left shoulder, you can see the branches of a fir tree that an eagle uses to spot fish. So this incredibly rich place at the edge of an estuary, rich in terms other than I think as being calculated by an energy company. So this is on an estuary arm of the Coos Bay and it's uh, on one of the proposed crossings to the Jordan Cove um, uh, liquefaction and export uh, plant. So this one has quite a variety of non-human inhabitants, including aquatic ones as the tide comes up in and out of the structure. Um, this is an estuary, as you know, so it has a really, really long species list. The marbled mirelet, the egrets, the geese, the herring, the salmon, the crabs, bobcat, otters, bears, bats, um, and all the things that are too small to see and all part of the continuum and the inseparable whole. So the portals are intended to transform perception of the places by demonstrating their value in terms of ecological holism, nutrient cycling, multi-species sheltering and habitat biodiversity. The value a value measured other than in terms of extraction and profit. And in this way, they're meant to subvert extraction based power structures and the, in, the installations are meant to embody a different measure of value for the land. In each of the portals, the, the loose thatch that spirals around them is meant to shed water down one side and, and then have the shelter for humans. And on the other side, the thatch is meant to collect the water and nutrients. And so, um, you know, as I said, that it's reasonable shelter for people. If you tuck yourself into the bench, the loose thatch uh, sheds rain and holds your warmth even in winter. And then the other half where loose thatch spirals upwards 
is um, not good shelter for humans, but catches rain, catches nutrients, and could offer purchase for a bird's nest. And they're intended to choreograph human experience of time as cyclical in weather, tides, water levels, planetary movement, and as material decays and accumulates. So in, in this way, the pavilions are meant to draw attention to the simultaneous ecological past and the future of the lands. So the portals have been in place about two years now, and they have a long list of mostly transitory inhabitants. Um, visiting students, bobcats, birds. Um, I'll say that I think that not where as much as these are intended to be nonviolent resistance to the pipeline construction, but I think that nonviolence resistance is powerful when the fundamental wrongness of something is made most visible. And when something that's the subject of care is in the path of harm. So I'm thinking of the image of the arrest of Rosa Parks, um, the most wrenching images of the children of war or displacement, past, current, or future. And my hope is that the images and also the experiences of these portals magnify the immeasurable good that the indivisible ecosystem communities hold and that they make it impossible to miss the truth that the construction of a gas pipeline and the places and these places would be visibly or immeasurably wrong. But I say that that's not to say that the good thing in the face of harm here is the portals themselves. Actually, the portals are temporary and uh, relatively disposable. And um, so in that the thing of value is the land itself, right? The dynamic, inseparable, multi-species whole. And my hope is that the portals, as they shape human perception of the profound and messy value of these places can bring out a shared profound sense of care for the places. So I'll wrap up with four things that guide my own work that I offer you maybe to guide your own, especially folks who are in the design for biodiversity, biodiversity and design studio. So one, design to recognize interconnection at all scales. Design relationships that are reciprocal, designed to recognize the indivisible, inseparable, messy whole. Two, find the pinch points. Where can you apply a little bit of pressure for a lot of consequence? This is meant to refer to the spatial aspects of resistance. Three, represent and so give agency to things of true perpetual value renewing value, include and emphasize cycles, renewal, the non-human whole, and then disempower through exclusion, the superficial, the short-term, and the one-time use. And then finally, use heart, care for, I think that care for a future, for a place is more powerful, rooted in love than it is rooted in reason. Okay. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to the team. Wow. Can we? Um, there we go. Thank you for that. That was amazing. Um, and I'm sure those questions and comments, but I just want to make fun. Um, you know, all along, I'm like, how can something so beautiful be uh, a space of protest? But then you got there uh, relative to this idea of care and the path of harm. Really quite, quite amazing and beautiful. Um, so thank you for that. You know, I, I guess my one question for you, Aaron, is who do you believe your audience is for this work? For the pipeline, for the yeah. portals project. Yeah, or like, you know, yeah. so, so yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the narrative that mm -hmm. sets it up in terms of the inseparable whole and mm -hmm. using design to put resistive forces in the path of just or destructive trajectories and then where you wind up relative to kind of a mm -hmm. you know, passive resistance or here, I would say through almost through beauty. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's so interesting. I feel like we're seeing this now in the, the visual images and 
narrative around war, where something that has, and I'm specifically referring to the um, aggression against Ukraine, that the um, if you have enough eyes on something, and if you have, if it's so clear that something is so clearly wrong, then it becomes less tenable to be able to do it. So you, to your question of who is the audience, I think it's as broad as possible. And so in this case, it became important not to have it be about being at the site or going to the design thing, you know, to the installations in person, but it came, became really important just to try to get as many eyes, use, use this and the kind of, um, honestly, social media around um, kind of charismatic architecture photos, especially of small things and big landscapes. Um, which is you know, something it's part of my work in general mm -hmm. um, to kind of use that tool too to get lots of eyes on things. <laughs> yeah, no, fantastic. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. So um, let me open it up to other comments or questions from those of you in the audience. I know, yeah, please. Can I ask you guys a quick question? Are you a question, sure. the instructors a question? Can I ask what? the design prompt is for the design of the biodiversity and design studio? Well, um, I don't think I was very clear. So that, we're, that this isn't actually related to a design studio. Oh, okay. The design studio is actually on sea level rise and, I got it. Um, and coastal communities, but there's definitely an intersection, certainly with regard to everything you were saying about the giving things power mm. through representation. Um, but yeah, so it's- so sea level rise, that's amazing. And yes, completely apt. Although I have to say, I see a student, a second year student here, Yifan, who is doing a project about biodiversity and design in second year. So I bet Yifan, you have a comment or a question for, for Aaron, don't you? Um, actually, yes. But if I don't have one, it will be a very embarrassing moment. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> no pressure. OK. Thank you, Professor Moore. That was an amazing lecture. I enjoyed the whole process. And I was particularly um, attracted by the, by the pet flight project as you introduced a lot and its simplicity and its powerful image. I guess um, at the beginning of the lecture, you were generally talking about two, making two cases. One is considering the inseparable, inseparable um, quality of matter and then the inseparable quality of time. And, and at the end of the lecture, we arrive at this very small scale, very low tech even um, uh, installation and a shelter for both human. And I guess the question, how to phrasing the question would be like, to explain more about how this large time and matter translates into this final low tech and installation. Yeah, I think that a, a, a architectural paradigm in which we truly acknowledge the the kind of materialism the, in the the vibrant matter of the the world we work in inherently makes us better at dealing with realities of things like climate change and material and, and carbon cycling and this fundamentally dealing with all of these things in a purposeful way is, is foundational. And so I think that you know, my, my work is meant to respond to failures to do that in the world and then also to offer alternative ways of thinking about um, alternative spatial practices and construction in consideration of material and place and, and biodiversity. Um, in terms of time, you know, definitely the case that I'm trying to make about the, the simultaneous past and future is one about how what's well, necessary to deal with climate change. And so I think that um, for climate change, yes, absolutely, we have to look at the future, we have to look at the timelines for um, making radical change in order to avert uh, enormous, um, even larger crisis and, and un, in, injustices and impact. 
Um, but in order to do that, we have to look back at some of the root uh, causes of, of, of climate change, which I argue are in kind of extractive colonialism and start to do some repair in retrospect or a repair in consideration of, of the history, especially in North America. And so you know, I think it's in looking more broadly, and this is not part of you know, th this talk or this project, I think, but, but other, other work is, is looking at uh, pipeline protest as it relates to uh, indigeneity in the Pacific Northwest and, and forms of protest that address specifically uh, colonialism. Yes, thank you for the answer that makes sense. And I guess more specifically to the pipeline project, and you, you mentioned you have enormous iterations, but yeah, it, I'm very curious, like how did you arrive at this? Because it's the structure is simple, but it's doing so much. So I guess, yeah, another question is about how did it arrive? Like, yeah. Well, I don't know, you know, other than saying from the diagram of the spiral and the idea of that and then figuring out how to make a, you know, all the parameters, right? What, what is something that uses material that um, has a purposeful lifespan, a purposeful forestry context or, you know, material context um, and that can be <laughs> constructed mostly offsite, carried by, by people in challenging sites put together quickly on site pretty rigid but comes apart too <laughs> i don't know it's connected to shifting ground i think one um you know i building on the edge of of water especially with the ecological complexity is not something that we should normally be doing right we want to with our with conventional buildings we want to give a lot of space to the river edge and the estuary edge and the wetland um this this is a little bit different where we're doing um you know, ideally in, um, in offering more rather than less habitat, more rather than less wildness and, and connecting to the ground with um, reversible helical piers. So, um, and they, they do have a finite lifespan after two years, the thatch on the up this side coming down, you can see more and, and pretty soon, I think ideally, if not very gracefully, they will be um, you know, very much in the nutrient cycle for these places as they rot. Thanks for explaining it. You answered all, yeah, my curiosity. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Yvonne. Can you hear me, Aaron? I can. can. Yeah, okay. Oh, hi. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I also to, see you. I had to escape because my computer ran out of juice. <laughs> I understand. Um, Julia introduced me to the pipeline project last year and just remarkably exciting project. And mm -hmm. Um, I, I think of it, and a beautiful drawing that explains so much. Uh, some of it, in, in a way, the, um, you know, the, the, the related to your kind of issues of, of matter and intersection and sort of cross, um, we'll say fertilization uh, in, the, in just the cladding. I'm interested in its future. I go to its past as a, in fact, it's technologically very complicated although built out of little pieces, but I think of it as a, a kind of semper frame with cladding, um, and you clad it differently depending on its, uh, its context, if you will. So, and I'm wondering about its future, just as a sort of system of construction, remarkably lightweight, it happens to be quite spectacularly this um, kind of cocoon, open-ended, but still cocoon right now, but I'm wondering about its other forms in the future. Do you mean specifically these three structures or the the? I the guess I'm thinking of that as a system of construction that's trying to through its. Mm -hmm. I guess it's cladding on the inside and it's cladding on the outside. Deal with this uh, multi-species mm -hmm. um, uh, environment that you're trying to support. Yeah, I don't know. In, I always am interested in in lightweight reversible construction. So, and always learning something new. And this has got me interested in um, uh, the ways that these plants, tule and juncus, are used regionally in basket making. And really interested in the kind of extension of or how this. Uh, 
uncovered holes in my own understanding kind of cultural material practices here in from Thule's and Junkes. It turns out they happen to be the two probably culturally most significant materials for you know, culturally for the last thousand thousands of years of these places. Um, so I'm probably more interested in going that direction than yes, always cool trusses. I will always be pursuing <laughs> trusses as a way of have lightweight rigidity. Um, and then these very specific, these three pavilions, as I think I was suggesting before, will be soon mud in a pile of, um, of hardware, which is, it is it will be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ideally, right? We don't want things lasting too long. Oh, and I will share good news as well, that this particular pipeline is no longer being pursued. It met a lot of resistance. Um, but I want to say that there are other pipelines, especially in the very most remote parts of British Columbia and Canada that are um, highly contested and, and weakly um, different forms of violence, especially in on, on tribal, unceded tribal land that's occurring that is worth paying attention to. Sure. Other questions or comments? I'm going to have to ask another one because I have a lot. So I'm going to have them let, I'll let you all think of another, but I have one, which is, and please do not take this in any way as me supporting the fossil fuel industry. However, I have a question about your work, which is, what role do you give us consumers relative to, you know, demands for energy, not uh, being able to, you know, adapt the way we live and the, the mm -hmm. kinds of places we live, the way you live that if I'm sitting here thinking, do I really need to have all these lights on while I'm listening to you? Like, mm -hmm. so your work, I'm not saying it's a straw mm -hmm. doll, the, the, the enemy you set up, mm -hmm. but it's, we're all complicit in it, are we not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I think that um, I feel quite strongly that while individual action is important, that that that's actually the red, that's the the straw doll. That the that in fact um, the the pointing of blame from corporations, from a few powerful greedy individuals um, towards the individual consumer is a really, really, really effective way of blame shifting. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it's far more important to look to those in power, whether that's corporate or political power, than it is to look to individuals for change. And so I, I guess I, my choice is to um, spend, as, spend energy uh, looking at the power structures rather than looking at the individual choice. Then I think about you know, the thing bicycling, I can't blame somebody for not bicycling more if, if the, um, those, you know, designing cities are designing them for, for cars. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a, yeah. So no massive small change. I mean, I'm remembering well, when Leonardo DiCaprio went on Oprah, right? And they all just held up a light bulb and said, this is the answer, right? If we all just change. Oh no, yeah. You remember you anyway. So, you know, like there is that whole discourse, right? About, about massive small change relative to I, yeah and i don't want to discount it and i think a lot of this is design and and when we're i think the work of teaching design is so important because it is teaching students humans to look beyond this or that but to find a, a third way not to get stuck in these dichotomies and so i think designing what is something in good ways forward is really really a uh, powerful thing, but I, I am very wary of um, yeah, blame, blame shifting to individuals. The, the, the emissions are way centered related to, to wealth and power. And so that's where I would look first. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, fantastic. Um, well, thanks so much for this invitation. It's great to be able to connect with you folks. And I appreciate the work that you're doing over there. Yeah, we uh, thank you so much, Aaron, for your very provocative lecture. That's and great. It was great. You have a great afternoon. Sounds good. Thanks. Everybody. Okay. Bye bye. bye.